if that's all right, if you could just leave them as they are. Thank you, Bob. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you, first of all, for coming. I've already had a couple of emails of people saying, sorry, I can't be here today, but I will be coming to all of the other... Can you just grab one of those documents off of there at the back? One of each. So that they can't become... We won't come today. Uh, but can I come to the other sessions? And in, if I don't come today and I come to the other sessions, is everything going to be all right? And the answer is yes, because we're going to video every lecture that we do. Okay, so the aim is that we're going to give two lectures a week, one on a Wednesday, one on a Thursday, and then we're going to run a workshop on a... Monday? Monday. On a Monday. Okay, so if you can get to as many of those as possible, please do. But I'd like to welcome you to CS50 DC. So what we are doing here is we are following the Harvard University CS50 AP course, and myself... Um, Mataza and Ocean, who are going to be the teacher fellows, are actually going to do these lectures, run these lectures, and help you with the workshops. So we're going to dive straight in. We're going to go for it straight away. They're going to hopefully be fast-paced, engaging. If you want to bring note paper in future, then let today's session be sort of like a, a, an, an idea to you as to whether that's going to be necessary, whether it's going to be feasible, even if you want to bring laptops. Okay? So this is CS50 DC, and the CS stands for computer science, and I guess that's why you've come here, because you want to learn about computer science, but fundamentally, what is computer science? And that's what it is. It's problem solving. It's being able to look at a problem and identify how you are going to solve that problem using a different uh, a variety of methods, where fundamentally we're going to use computers to help us solve that problem. And when we look at computers, there's a couple of things that you probably already know about them. A computer takes an input and it gives us an output. And what we do in the middle is the problem solving. So like I've just said, computer science is all about problem solving. And it's being able to understand these inputs that we are given, which is going to be the problem, and understanding these outputs that we want which is going to be the solution, and then we do the little bit in between, what we call the black box. We're going to solve the problem. And today's lesson is going to be about that problem solving and how we go about it. So, when we talk about problems, I'm just going to go back a slide actually. When we talk about problems, when we talk about this idea of having an input and an output, we've got to look at the fundamentals of a computer and what its inputs are. And at the absolute core, the input of a computer is just power, just electricity being plugged into it to make it switch on. Yep, and I don't know too much about science. You probably know more about me when it comes to your physics, your chemistry, your biology. But I know there's these things called electrons. And when we plug something into our computer, we give it these electrons and they go around inside our CPU and they do something. And that is what we're going to look at today in terms of that's what we're dealing with with regards to inputs at absolute raw root level. And so when we have these electrons going around in our computer, it's quite difficult to understand how we can interpret those electrons being inside our computer. But fundamentally, electrons, they're either there or they're not. We have, have electricity going into our computer or we don't have electricity going into our computer. We either have high voltages going around the processor or we have low voltages going around the processor. So in order to contextualize that and in order to get that into our heads visually, then what we do is we represent those electrons as zero, there aren't any, and one, there are some. And we could have actually globally represented that in a different way. We could have said true or false. True, there are electrons. False, there aren't any electrons. Or yes, there are. Or no, there aren't. But we've decided to do it in binary. This binary idea is that we have a zero, and we have a 1, and like I've just said, the 0, the electrons aren't there, and the 1s, they are. And what we can do is we can use this uh, binary pattern of a 0 and 1 to solve the problems between the input and the output. And what we do, and we're going to lead on to in just uh, a short while, is we, we actually label this problem-solving concept as an algorithm. 
So we construct algorithms as our solutions to get from this input stage to this output stage. So there might be a problem, for example, that we want to count the attendance of people in this room. Okay, and one way that we could do it is we could say, we could use the, um, instead of using the binary method, we could actually use the unary method to count how many people are in this room. So if binary uses two numbers to represent, we could actually just use one number to represent. And I could count, you go, well, there's uh, one, there's two, there's three, there's four, there's five, there's six, and we could do that. But again, Computers have electrons going in, and we can either have them switched on or off. So we actually have two symbols that we can use to represent information inside a computer. Because this is represented information here. People are present. How many? We could say there are six. And I've represented that information just by using these unary values of one. So I can actually represent information in these zeros and ones as well, and that's what computers do. They map this idea of information to these zeros and ones. And that shouldn't be very unfamiliar to you because we do it ourselves in our decimal system. So in our decimal system, we don't have just one value like the unary system. We don't just have two values like the binary system. We have 10. We have zero through to nine. And what we can do with that is we can represent information. Because all these are, on the screen here, are just squiggles. That's it. It just so happened that we've said, oh, this is a one. That is a one. And this is a two. And then they're just squiggles. But what we can do with it is we can actually represent information through these squiggles. So here, what, rep what am I represented? I'm represented the number 123. And you've learned that ever since you were probably like four years old. My daughter is four years old and she's learning her hundreds, her tens and her units. And that's what they are. When you're at school, you might put the H above this to represent hundreds, a T above this to represent the twos, uh, the tens, and a U above this to represent the units. But fundamentally what we're doing is we're saying, well, there's one lot of a hundred, there's two lots of ten, and there's three lots of one, so we have the number, the information, 123. So that's something that you shouldn't be unfamiliar with. We do that every day. And we, the thing is, you know, it's, the computers aren't much more complicated than that because computers do exactly the same thing. They represent information, but they only have binary, like I've just said. They only have electrons on or electrons off, and we can represent that as one or zero, so we can then map information to that. And as long as we have an international standard that we all agree on this, that whoever manufactures computers, whoever builds programs for those computers, if we have an international standard that we all agree on, then everyone can map information to these sequences of zeros and ones. And so if I say that if we have a decimal system, if you notice on the previous slide, we're always working to the powers of 10. So if I wanted to increase this number from 999, which is the largest I can have, then I would need another column here, which would be representing the thousandths column. But in binary, we work in powers of 2. So just like our binary system, we've got headings at the top there, but these are all to the power of 2. So 2 to the power of 0 is 1, 2 to the power of 1 is 2, 2 to the power of 3 uh, is 4, etc, etc. Sorry, 2 to the power of 2 is 4. So if I wanted to represent the number 0, I would do this. What would I do if I wanted to represent the number 1? What would that look like on here? Anyone? Yeah, Will. 0, 0, 1. So if I wanted to represent the number 1 in binary, it would be that. What about if I wanted to represent the number 2? Yeah. 0, 1, 0. So if I wanted to represent the number 2, I'd do this. What about if I wanted to represent the number 3? 0, 1, 1. Yeah, we're, we're building this up. So what we're doing now is just like we were mapping information to those squiggles of the 1s, the 2s, the 3s, the 4s, we're now doing the same here. 
We're, we're mapping information to these sequences of zeros and ones. What information are we mapping? We're mapping numbers that we understand. And we've got a counting system now. There's four, there's five, there's six. And obviously the biggest number that I can have here is seven. Now, if all computers could do is just represent three lots of zeros and ones, we wouldn't be able to store very much information. But fortunately, we can actually do more than that. And so, what I want you to think about, and I'm going to ask someone to come to the front in a minute, is if these represent just electrons being inside the computer being switched on, or inside the computer and those being switched off, we can actually represent them through these lights here as if the electrons were power going into the computer and switching on circuits inside a computer. Or more specifically, if I represent the number 5 here by using these, these are just like transistors that exist inside every computer that we can have either on or off. But these transistors are at a microscopic level. And we've got billions of them, billions, 1.4 billion transistors I've got just on this laptop here. 1.4 billion of these. So if in eight, I can represent, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But in three, if I can represent seven different pieces of information just on three of them, well, I can actually represent eight if you think about zero. If I, on three of them, I can represent seven pieces of information, and there are 1.4 billion in this computer here alone. I can represent a lot of information inside a computer. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite volunteers to come down and see if they can represent for me this number 42 in the binary system that we have here. Would anyone like to come down and have a go at doing that? So we were able to represent the number 7 by switching all of these on. But I want someone to come down and represent for me the number 42. Anybody? Take us. Yeah, come down. What's your name? Mohammed. Mohammed. Mohammed, I'm going to switch them off. And if you can represent for me the number 42. Okay, so we have one lot of 32. We have one lot of 8. And we have one lot of 2. Thank you, Mohammed, if you want to take a little duck. Thank you very much. He's got that right. Okay, so let's have another go at this. Let's, um, let's try a tricky one. What about if I wanted to represent the number 50? Who would like to have, come and have a go at this one? Yeah, come down then. Right, I'm going to make this a little bit harder. We should be able to do this. The number 50. <clears throat> so think about your powers of 2. Okay, so what's that one representing? 32. 32. So what, what, what else do we need? We need... How many more do we need? If we have 32 and we want to make 50, we need... We need 18 more, yeah? So you've got to make 18. Now what's that one representing? 8. But now you need to represent 10. How about if this one's 32, what is this one? At 16, excellent. And that one's a 2. Is that what we've got? We've got everything we need. 32 plus 16 plus 2. Yeah, well done, fantastic. That's right, there you go. Treat yourself to a bit. Okay, so here we're representing the number 50. And what we can actually do with just 8 bits, which is actually something that we need inside a computer, because 8 bits represents a byte, and we can actually store one piece of data, such as a letter, inside one byte, inside eight bits of these. And if we just had one byte, does anybody know what the amount of different pieces of information we can map to one byte is? If here, if on three, I can map seven pieces of information, or eight if I count the zeros, how many can I map? to eight bits. Mohammed? 256. 256. And I put 255. 256 is the correct answer if you're counting the zeros. Yeah? So that's fantastic. Well done. Okay. So, 
if we were just representing numbers, that wouldn't be fantastic because all we could do with computers then is just re represent numbers. So what was agreed a very long time ago was this standard that says, you know what? If we can represent numbers in just zeros and ones like we've just done now, then we can represent letters as long as we have this international standard that says these binary sequences of zeros and ones, so for example, these binary sequences of zeros and ones like this, if we have an international agreement that they can also represent other things, like letters, like colors, like sounds, then we can make computers do a heck of a lot more. So there's a standard called the ASCII standard. And that ASCII standard says, well, you know what? If you have the binary sequence of numbers that make the deanery or decimal number 65, everyone in the world or every machine in the world will represent that as a capital A. Yeah, and every computer in the world that can represent the number 66 in a binary sequence will represent that as a capital B, etc., etc. So if this in mind, I've got A, B, C all the way through to I, 65 to 73, what word, what word am I representing here if I have these values on? So I'll just flip back. So look at what we're doing. We're mapping information to numbers and those numbers are mapped to zeros and ones so what word am i making there anyone alex hi hi that'll give me the h here and the i here but what about this one i an exclamation mark or <laughs> excellent excellent so i didn't put them all on but we actually have 128 using the ascii value 128 different characters letters uh, quotation marks, commas, full stops, spaces that we can represent with a sequence of binary numbers. Now, if we can understand that, if we can say these zeros and ones can represent information, then if we go all the way back to the first line, and I'm just going to skip over this a minute, if we go back all the way here, we can say, right, well, if we can map these zeros and ones to information, and we've got these inputs, which is these electrical pulses going in, zeros and ones, that we can then map to information, we can start thinking about how we get these outputs. So that's my introduction to binary from you. I'm now going to uh, hand over to Ojem, who's going to talk about the black box a little bit more. Okay, I'll switch it over to you. So, Mr. Woodsitz has talked to you about binary, which is really at the heart of computers. But now we're going to take a step back, zoom out a little bit, and look at the bigger picture. And if we look at this graphic here, we can see the inputs and the outputs are clear. So, for example, we flick a switch, the lights come on. Input and an output. We can type something on the keyboard, the characters show up on our screen. Input and the output. The real mysterious part and the really interesting part happen right in the middle here, in the black box. As Mr. Wood said, this is where something called the algorithm happens. Of course, that's the computer's job. It does these algorithms. It performs a series of steps to achieve a certain task or to perform a certain task. And uh, I think um, this certain concept is much easier explained through a demonstration rather than just me talking at you. So what I'm going to do is um, show you guys a problem. We're going to solve a problem together. So for example, let's say we have a dictionary. Our inputs are a dictionary and a word that we want to find the definition to. And we're going to perform some kind of algorithm with it, and we hope to output um, the definition of that word. So can anybody throw me a word that they'd like to know the definition to? Anything. Um, yeah? No, I think I'll go for a different one. I'm going to go for mnemonic. Mnemonic, sure. <clears throat> so we want to find the word mnemonic in the dictionary. So we want to find an algorithm to search for that word. Um, a reasonable method could be, if you're quite stupid, you could literally go through the pages one by one until you hit that word. And of course, between each flip, you're checking if the word mnemonic is on there, and eventually you're going to get to that word, right? Uh, in the case of mnemonic, we know it's quite far back in the book because it's in the letter P. It's going to take quite a while. It's going to take quite a long time. So let's say here's a brilliant idea. How about, instead of just going through one page at a time, we're going to go through two pages at a time. That's going to speed up the process by twice as much, right? But there is a clear flaw in this specific algorithm, and can anybody kind of point that out to me? Yeah? I just skip straight past the page that the yeah. 
Exactly. So the word that you're looking for, in this case, a mnemonic, may be sandwiched in between the two pages. So you know, these are two examples of linear search algorithms, because I'm sort of linearly at a constant rate going through the book, one by one or two by two. And as we pointed out, the two by two method does have a flaw in it that 50% of the words may not be actually found. So there's clearly got to be a better way to do this, right? Rather than just linearly going through this, especially if your letter, if your word starts with an X or a Z or a Y, that's going to take a long time. So I'm going to propose a method to you in which, uh, which requires a lot of kind of human intuition. You know, if somebody handed you a dictionary and said, look up the word mnemonic for me, the first thing you would, you would do wouldn't be to just go through the pages one by one, right? You'd get laughed at. What you'd do is just kind of uh, go to the middle of the book, open it up, see where you are, and see where the word that you're looking for relatively is. So right now I'm at the letter M and we want to go to the letter P, which we know is LMNOP, on the right side of the book. So what we can do here, if I can take the spine off, okay, is, out. <laughs> is literally rip the problem in half and throw away the other half, because we don't need it, right? So with one step, we've literally cut the size of the problem into half. And I know the word mnemonic is here, and we can repeat the same process over and over again. So I kind of go to the middle over here, I've got the letter S. So once again, if I can cut this, if I can, there we go. That, yeah, we can throw this away. <laughs> With the book, uh, some pages are coming off. But you kind of get the point. Uh, I can keep repeating this half, I'm at P, and, but then I can look at the next letter, O, I know N is before that, and keep doing the same algorithm until I eventually find the word. And what you realize is for the vast majority of words, unless the word is you know, beginning with an A, like apple or something, which is right at the beginning of the dictionary, for the vast majority, this is considerably faster. And this is a method called binary search, because we're literally, binary implies two. We're cutting the problem into half with every step that we're taking here, right? And I think this is really um, well graphically shown here with this graph. So if we have the x as the size of the problem, or the number of pages of the dictionary in this case, and the time to solve on the y-axis, the first algorithm, the linear search, where you go through page by page, would kind of look something like this. It's a linear algorithm, so it's got this straight line over here, and we take n as the number of pages. So the maximum, number of uh, the maximum amount of time it's gonna take is however many pages there are. So if I double the amount of pages, it's gonna take double the amount of time. And we can see this with the second algorithm again, that's a straight line, but of course, because we're going through two pages at a time, it's twice as fast. So for a given size of the problem, we only need half the time to solve it. But as we pointed out, there is a clear flaw with that. Now the final one that we looked at, the binary search, has a very interesting shape. And it's something like this. And we can see that in the beginning here, uh, for a very, very small minority of words, it is actually slower than the n over 2 algorithm. However, for the vast majority, it's much faster. And I know we haven't, a lot of us haven't covered logs yet in math yet. And what this basically means, and for your mathematicians out there, by the way, there's an implied log two there, because it's going through two, uh, it's gonna cut the problem in uh, two pieces at a time. But what this basically means is, with every step that we're taking, with every process that the computer does, it's literally, as I said, just cutting it in half each time. And the magic of this is, the larger the size of the problem gets, the quicker you can actually solve it. Or not the quicker you can solve it, but relative to these other al algorithms, you can solve them considerably quicker. So consider a dictionary of 1,000 pages. If we're using a linear search algorithm, that's gonna take 1,000 steps at the maximum, right? Because we're gonna go through one page at a time. In the binary search, it's gonna take around 10 steps, because two to the 10 is 1024. So it's gonna take approximately 10 steps. Now, if we have a dictionary of 2,000 pages, the linear search is gonna take 1,000 extra steps, so 2,000 steps in total. Whereas, if we use the binary search method, we only need to perform one extra step. So that's go from 10 to 11, because we just half uh, 2,000 into 1,000, and we're left with the initial, the same problem as we had in the, in the beginning. So this is really interesting how binary search has a much shorter time as uh, the size of the problem grows and grows. And now we've looked at three algorithms here, and what we're going to try to look at is something called pseudocode. Now the problem with uh, what we've learned so far is that we know how to do this, we know how to search through this, but we can't just go up to a computer and tell it to do it, right? It's not going to understand you. And the way to communicate with a computer is through something called a programming language, which we're not going to go on to yet. But pseudocode, as the name implies, is sort of like fake code, in that it's a way for humans to understand an algorithm, to write down an algorithm step by step, to know what's going on, 
And once we know the logic, once we understand the algorithm, we can then go on to write in a programming language, or we can write in a programming language for a computer to understand it. So if we're gonna try to write the binary search algorithm in pseudocode, it would look something like this. Uh, the first step you'd do is to pick up the dictionary, right? Next, you'd open to the around the middle of the dictionary, as I did. And third, you'd look at the words that are there, read through all of them. Now, if, let's say we're looking for the word wizard, if wizard is among the words, we can read the definition, because that's the output that we want, right? And notice the indentation here. Because we've got a conditional statement, a line five read definition is only going to be run if wizard is among the words, if this conditional statement is true. And we can say else, if wizard is earlier in the book, because it may not be among the words, we could open to the middle of the left hand of the book and go to line three. What's interesting here is once we go here, we're repeating the same process over and over again. So it's kind of redundant to write out the whole thing once again. So we can simply say, go back to line three. And if you want to be really technical about it, there's kind of a recursive structure here, but we'll talk about that much more deeply later in the course. And of course, what it could be later in the book, we'd go to the right half and go to line three again to repeat that same process on the right hand side of the book. And you know, if, if you keep doing that, you get to the end and you still can't find the word, you should probably just give up uh, and search it on Google or something. And this is kind of an example of an algorithm written in pseudocode. And now Murtaza is going to come up and hopefully guide you guys through writing your very first algorithm of how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich um, no in jelly. this CS50 course. What? No jelly. No jelly. It's peanut butter sandwich. Uh, thanks. Right. So um, I did say when, we, uh, when I was advertising the course that you would need no previous skills to come here. But I did kind of lie. Because what we have here is a few inputs. So we have um, peanut butter, knives, and bread. And the output that we want is a peanut butter sandwich, which you can see here. And the skill that you guys are going to need is the ability to make a peanut butter sandwich, because I'm going to ask for a couple of volunteers to come and make peanut butter sandwiches. Any takers? Yep, Alex, come here. Anybody else? Anybody else? Um, Matt, you look like you want to do it. Uh, okay, Will? Uh, come on, MK. You get a free duck. Now, what we're going to do is you guys are going to teach them how to create a peanut butter sandwich. You are going to write the algorithm. So, what we're going to do is, um, one by one, I'm going to ask for a step in this algorithm. And then I'm going to write it down. So, anybody know the first step in making a peanut butter sandwich? Yeah. Open the jar of peanut butter. Open the jar. That clearly didn't work. Anybody have another step that might be a bit better? Unscrew the lid. Unscrew the lid. <laughs> okay, so they've unscrewed the jars now. Now what? Is the sandwich done? No, okay, yes? Pretty good, pretty good. Now what? Take the bread out of the bag. Take the bread out of the bag. <laughs> 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 Just 
shout them out. <laughs> Anybody next? Shout it out. Uh, take two slices of bread. Take two slices of bread. Them. <laughs> what do they want to do with the two slices? Yeah. Dip the knife into the jar. Dip the knife. <laughs> <laughs> Is in the jar. Um, I want to fix the, the, uh, the last statement. You want to fix the last one? The sharp yeah. edge of the knife in the jar. Dip the sharp <laughs> edge. <laughs> <laughs> so you've just detected a bug and fixed it. With the so help of sticking up. <laughs> and I think almost there. <laughs> Last step, anyone? No, put the second slice of bread over the side of the bread that you just covered with peanut butter. So, so that it's it covers each other. Nice <laughs> <laughs> the Bread on the other bread. Okay, not bad. Well done. <laughs> Round of applause for the volunteers. <laughs> and you are free to eat your peanut butter sandwiches if you want. <laughs> Gift for each of you. Thank you for volunteering. And what we. <laughs> what, what, no. <laughs> what we demonstrated here was that when you write an algorithm, you have to keep in mind that computers follow exact instructions. <laughs> so um, this, is, this is a core part of computer science, is that when we're designing these algorithms to turn our inputs into outputs, we need to be very careful. Now the algorithm that you guys designed, when you started saying instructions, you realized that the computer was not cooperating because the computer doesn't understand what you mean. The computer can't guess what you're trying to say. So you have to say exactly what you want it to do. And um, this is the fundamental, one of the fundamental parts of computer science. Um, throughout the course, we will learn how to develop algorithms that are specific and efficient, which this one was not. But as a first attempt at writing pseudocode, you guys did pretty well, so thank you. Uh, this is CS50DC. This has been the first lecture, and um, thank you all for being here. Before you leave, there's like somewhere I can watch my So before you leave, um, this is a this is a uh, um, an initiative that we as a school are very excited about. There is no other school in the Middle East doing this. We are going to offer this course as teacher and students teaching the course. We are going to not put it on our timetable. It's invite only. You're here because you've got an interest. So that's the first thing. That's not being done anywhere else here in the Middle East. The second thing is that as far as I know, as far as I know, we are the only British curriculum school that is offering an AP qualification in this. And more, more of that to come. That's got a lot of things going on in the background with Mr. Miles, for example, sorting out all the paperwork for that to happen. I know a lot of you are here regardless of this AP qualification, which is great. But that is going to be an option for you. That is going to be something you can do with this course if you want to. 
you can sit that exam and, and do this course if you want to. Um, this was the first one. We've been planning it for a while. We didn't know how it was going to go with timings. We didn't know how it was going to go with how many of you were going to attend. What we want, what we want, all three of us, is we want this to grow. I actually said when we sat down last year and thought about this, I said, if one person turns up, that's enough. If we can just interest one person in this subject, in this passion we've got, that's enough. The fact that we've got so many of you here, I, I'm absolutely ecstatic. I'm going to go and have a big smile, a big cup of tea and a biscuit when this is finished. I am genuinely, I'm really chuffed to bits. I was going to invite Mr. Lambert to pop in and I thought I, I didn't because I said I don't mind if one turns up. But he might be like, oh, what's going on? I wish I'd invited him in because I think he would be overwhelmed by you have taken out your time. <laughs> yeah, he'd be overwhelmed with what's going on here. But he'd be overwhelmed that you've come out of your free periods from your carousels to come here and learn something that we're going to offer you. We're going to continue to offer this. Like I said, if you cannot make every one, keep interested. We're going to post all of this online. There's going to be lots of resources. Next session, tomorrow, we're going to introduce the first problem set. So there's going to be lecture, lectures, problem sets that you have to go and solve in your own time. And they are going to get progressively more difficult, more challenging, but definitely, if you've got an interest in this subject, more engaging as well. And more satisfying. More satisfying. Because solving these problems is, it, for me personally, it's very satisfying when you've, you've made a computer do something. You know, you've identified this problem, you've then developed a solution. If you have any questions about this, we're all contactable through our DC email addresses. And as I said, Matarza and Ocean are, are leading this course as much as me. Everything I know, they know. Everything they know, I should know. So if you want to contact anyone, don't feel like you've got to contact me. You contact them. We meet every week to talk about these lectures. Uh, and so if you would like to get on board at all with this, if you would like to help us, let me give you an insight. We've got a YouTube channel. I've advertised it on the cards. We need some help managing that. We need some help designing that. We want to do all these sorts of things with this CS50 course. And if you've got any interest in getting on board more than just participation, then please just speak to one of us. We're willing to get you on board. Spread the word, please. I'd really like by the end of the year 100 subscribers to this YouTube channel. I'm not saying 100 people come in here, but that we've generated interest and we're seeing that people want to do this. So if you could spread the word as well as you can spread peanut butter, um, we might get somewhere. <laughs> we are, well, we are now finished, so that is it. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. Also, uh, the next session is tomorrow, third period as well. So in just here. keep that in mind. Yeah, same place. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.